NMDC and the National Steel Raw Material Exploration Agency. Mr. Emma Bassi was appointed chairman of the NGFC board, while Chief Godspower Okoe and Barista Sebastian Ibezim, the COMEC and NMDC board respectively. The Steel Raw Materials Exploration Agency board will now be chaired by Dr. Yomi Fini. While inaugurating the board, Dr. Fani said it is important for the new appointees to bring their wealth of experience to bear on their agencies to move the mining industry forward in line with the economic recovery and growth plan of the federal government. I therefore offer no consent to study and strictly adhere to the laid down laws that have clearly defined the roles and responsibilities of the board members. I have made available to all chairmen and board members the Nigerian Mining and Minerals Act 2007. Also made available mining policy, mining guidelines, and documents that we believe will be of assistance to introduce yourself to the sector if you are not already familiar with the sector. Speaking on behalf of the newly inaugurated chairman, Mr. Abasi expressed gratitude for the opportunity given them to serve, saying that they will perform their duties diligently and lawfully. We must all be appreciated to the President of the Federal Court of Nigeria for taking it part and deeming it fit to get also appointed to help in driving the administration to some good news. Remarks, the permanent of the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development, yes, Dr. Abdul Qadir Mazu, noted that whilst the board will not be involved in the agencies, they are expected to provide policy direction. I wish to remind you that members of parasitals are part time boards. They are not executive boards. And they are constructed to provide policy direction for achieving the mandates of their agencies. Provided in their respective acts. The day to day of the agencies with the respective needs of the various agencies. I also wish to remind us that the boards are supposed to directly the honorary minister. Dignitaries at the event include one time Minister of Solid Minerals, Al Haji Sharafatunji Ishola, Member of the House of Representatives, Honorable Abdullah. Nigerian Mining and Geosciences Society, Professor Sai Dada. The post-Earthquake data generation is a key mandate of the Ministry of Finance and Steel Development. The understanding is that the first thing an investor wants to know is the occurrence of mineral deposits and their locations. Our next segment on the issues take a look at what the Ministry is doing to make data available, especially through the Nigerian Geological Survey Agency. The front room of the Nigeria Geological Survey Agency displays several solid mineral samples, evidence of past surveys, storing vital information that should interest investors interested in mining. Why then is it that when the challenges militating against the development of the mining sector are being cited, the non-availability of geoscientific data comes up? What is the true position of Nigeria when it comes to geoscientific data to support mining? I think I have to correct one impression. It's not really the absence 
all of these things I've told you have been activities of the Geological Survey providing data. So what we'll rather say is that we've not gotten to the level that we are competitive globally. So we are working towards that. And definitely, uh, one of the areas that we are emphasizing is this generation of data. And one of the challenges we've had in the past is inconsistency of policies. Oftentimes, different administrations have come with their own different areas of preference. It may not be mining. It may be some other place. And because of that, the funding profile for the sector has been very abysmal. The Nigeria Geological Survey Agency is the body tasked, amongst other things, to provide geoscientific data to support mining activities, a task they have been performing since pre-colonial times. The successes of the NGSA are what gave Nigeria the first boom in solid mineral mining decades ago. By next year, 2019, the Geological Survey will be a century that is 100 years old. And Geological Survey was actually instrumental to the discovery of a lot of the minerals that Nigeria depended on pre-independence. That is the tin, the columbite, the gold, the limestone, the coal, and many others. So basically, the Geological Survey was established to ensure that mineral resources of Nigeria are properly captured. Of truth, the availability of adequate geological data can easily point an investor to where the minerals are deposited. The Ministry of Mines and Steel Development is aware of this fact and is making concerted effort to increase the quality and volume of geological data. But generating geological data is capital intensive and follows a number of processes. Geological data involves a wide range of activities. Let me start with airborne data. Airborne data involves flying an aircraft at a particular altitude clearance. And within the aircraft, you have sensors that gives you either the density or the conductivity or the magnetic susceptibility of minerals and rocks that are not only on the surface, but are buried deep down the earth. This is one aspect. And of course, after the airborne data, you need to do ground routing, what we call ground routing. You need to go and verify whether the anomalies you have seen in the air is represented on ground. Then you can do geophysical surveys. As part of efforts to indicate Nigeria's readiness to compete in the global mining world, the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development recently retrieved and represented the electromagnetic survey results prepared some years ago. What exactly does this mean and what added benefit will this add to the Nigerian mining jurisdiction? The fact that we have secured 26,000 line kilometers of EM data is, is, is a move in the right direction and I am absolutely confident that in the next couple of years, we are going to see a deluge of you know, mining investors you know, coming to Nigeria to invest based on the EM data. And moreover, EM data is basically a higher resolution uh, information because we had already done the magnetic, radiometric, and gravity airborne data. But EM data is like getting to the next level of uh, uh, higher resolution that will actually in, uh, interest a lot of investors because it properly defines uh, metallic minerals, minerals of high conductivity, uh, and many other minerals that do respond to the signals of uh, EM. Moving on from the successes recorded with the formal presentation of the airborne electromagnetic survey data to the world, the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development is set to carry out more geoscientific surveys as well as improve capacity for testing minerals. This, the minister stated while defending the 2018 budget before lawmakers at the National Assembly. We 
are interested and it's a priority issue to generate qualitative geological data because what we have now in this electromagnetic survey that we have retrieved gives us information that is definitive. But you still need to do what in geology they call ground tooting uh, in the areas that you find to be uh, mineral rich you then need to do drilling and do additional work, and that is what we believe we would focus on. The Ministry of Mines and Steel Development is not stopping at generating geoscientific data only. It is also putting it in a globally accessible format so that investors can access such data. We have a website where we have our data domiciled, and the investors are supposed to key into our website. And we also have a, a portal by the Ministry of Mines and Steel Development. Our own website is, has a link to that portal. So these are all platform and avenues where we are increasing our visibility worldwide. Somebody in Canada or Australia can, you know, it's electronic. So somebody in all these uh, mining nations can go to their website make inquiries. On a daily basis, we receive hundreds of inquiries regarding information we generate on our website, and we respond accordingly. The availability and accessibility of geoscientific data is what makes the difference between a country blessed with mineral resources and a mining nation. The appeal by the DG of the Geological Survey Agency is for government to sustain its renewed vigor to generate supporting data to turn Nigeria's fortunes around for good. We've not, never really had it so good. Uh, so what I would rather say is that government should keep it up. They should not uh, relent in constantly pushing forward the frontiers of the mining sector. It's true that it has long, long gestation, which sometimes discourages people. When you tell somebody that uh, yeah, you have to invest for 10 years, 15 years before you start seeing the product. Yeah, these are the prices we have to pay for us to be where we want to be. If you consider the oil industry, for instance, they had explored the oil for more than 30 years before we had the first oil discovery in 1957. But the only thing we are seeing now are the benefits of the oil. We didn't understand the price that was paid for us to be where we are today in the oil industry. And this is exactly what the government should focus on in the solid mineral sector. The recent release of the Airborne Electromagnetic Survey results prepared more than a decade ago is proof of the ministry's drive to make qualitative data readily available for both local and foreign investors. With such efforts, it is hoped that Nigeria can begin to compete favorably with renowned mining jurisdictions around the world. The Nigeria Mining and Geosciences Society is our stakeholder of the week. What exactly does this professional body represent in the Nigeria mining industry? Let's find out. Our core mandate is to develop their capacity. So I think we are ready to work with the ministry. Transparency and accountability is being brought into mining. This is one of the ways we can increase the non oil export revenues. Well, NMGS is. Uh... It's composed of uh, professionals in all areas of the geosciences. That is uh, what people call earth sciences now. Mineral exploration, petroleum, water resources, uh, geotechnics, engineering geology, hydrogeology, all kinds. Government is losing money. The mining uh, companies, small and medium, they cannot register because they have to pass through Comeg. You have to know that these people are competent people. So long as that is not done, 
the ministry is losing money, the, con the country is not moving forward in terms of the, the development of the mining sector. What the minister is doing now, the two ministers are joining hands together to do a good job. So if they're able to continue that way for maybe this roadmap, we're able to continue along that line for the next five years, uh, we may not go back again to the uh, sleep we had. We slept for a long time. Knowing that trained professionals and experts are passionately interested and are being carried along in the solid mineral sector signifies that the country has the necessary intellectual capacity to move the sector forward. All that is needed, as the president of the NMGS has said, is improved synergy between government and all stakeholders so that all efforts will be harnessed to actualize the nation's diversification agenda. We will now take highlights of events across the mining world. Supply of diamonds is expected to contract by 3.4% to 147 million carats in 2018. This is against consistent increases over the last couple of years and by 11% in 2017. Production is expected to decline from two of the world's top diamond producers. The Democratic Republic of Congo is set to launch new monitoring and tracing mechanisms to overcome the challenges of child labor in cobalt and copper production. Congo is the world's largest producer of cobalt, accounting for more than half of the world's supply. One-fifth of this cobalt is however mined by informal miners, some of which are children. Shipments of Coal India Limited have risen 4.8% from last year. There has also been an increase in output for a seventh straight month as power plants increased fuel to renew stockpiles and meet the rising demand for electricity. Leader of the world's biggest miner, Andrew McKenzie of BHP has called on all producers and executives from steel-dependent companies to meet with U.S. President Donald Trump to fight the planned increase of import tariff on steel and aluminium. Whereas Trump believes the tariff increase to 25% and 10% for steel and aluminium respectively will safeguard American jobs, industry players believe the impact of the price hike on the auto and oil industries will destroy more jobs than create. As the days go by, we continue to witness the transformation taking place in the solid mineral sector with a strong desire to make mining a big contributor to the nation's economy. Today's edition has been another expose into the activities of the Ministry of Mines and State Development in pursuance of this mandate. Do join us same time next week as we go on another amazing journey into the solid mineral sector in Nigeria. Bye for now. Hi, I'm Abiodun Koya. 40 years is a significant milestone in the life of every being. So it is with NTA, the premier television network for the nation and her citizens. The history of Nigeria cannot be complete without acknowledging the role played by NTA. In any case, NTA is one of the very few institutions that can relate that history eloquently. I am a singer and NTA has partnered with me and others in my profession to bring joy and happiness to millions across the nation and beyond. Here's to wishing NTA a happy 40th anniversary. Long live NTA, long live the Federal Republic of Nigeria.
I thank God for the privilege of having had my major working experience with the NTAs, provided with the foundation as I started work, you know, away from school and home. And, you know, growing from NTA Channel 7 to NTA Network was also a very fantastic experience for me. So for me, no regrets whatsoever. In fact, my life cannot be complete without my story in NTA. My life would have probably been a different story if I hadn't had the privilege and opportunity of having worked at NT, having met fantastic people in my life, having made friends, you know, and having had people who made a difference in my life. And I also believe that I also made a difference in the lives of some other people. So no regrets whatsoever, but glory and gratitude to the Almighty God. As NT marks its 40th anniversary, I wish you 400, 4,000 <laughs> more successful years. I just wish that NT grows stronger, there's always room for improvement, and I know you continue to improve. Nigeria relies on you. Be fair, be balanced in your reporting, in your content, in everything you do. And you know what? Nigeria cannot be the same without NTA. So keep um, reaching out to everybody, and you still can't be the rich forever. <laughs>
options on the Nigerian Television Authority, the NTA. It is our discussion segment, and our focus is on the burden of TB in Nigeria and control efforts. First, this background report by Aisha Uba Ali. Tuberculosis, TB, is a disease said to be the ninth leading cause of death globally. Among factors that aid vulnerability to TB and access to care are malnutrition, poor housing and sanitation, compounded by other risk factors such as tobacco and alcohol use and diabetes. The Tuberculosis Global Report of 2017 indicates that TB is responsible for the death of nearly 1.7 million people each year and confirms that Nigeria is the seventh among the 30 high TB burden countries in the world and second in Africa. More disturbing is the fact that while other countries are gradually winning the war against TB, the case is that Nigeria is yet to attain the desired results. Unlike in the past, government program towards ending TB has been initiated. These include providing universal access to quality care, efficient surveillance and tracking of patients, among others. Despite significant progress over the last decades, TB continues to be the top infectious killer worldwide, claiming over 4,500 lives a day. The emergence of multi-drug resistant TB poses a major health security threat and could risk gains made in the fight against TB. March 24th every year is also a day set aside to observe the World Tuberculosis Day with the intent on intensifying awareness, strengthening collaboration of development partners and increased fund towards reducing its mortality rate. According to the National TB and Leprosy Control Program, there are thousands of new cases every year in Nigeria. To compound the challenge, substantial numbers of the people infected in the country are unreported or undiagnosed. Most of them women and children in neighborhoods where poor ventilation abates the spread of the disease. <music> Thank you, Aisha. Joining me in the studio to discuss the topic is Dr. Adebola Lawansen. She is the National Coordinator, TB and Leprosy Control Program, Federal Ministry of Health. Welcome to Health Options, Doctor. Thank you very much and good evening. Okay, we're looking at tuberculosis and we know that the burden is really high. Let us into the Nigerian situation, even though the statistics have been ruled out in that background report. Actually, in Nigeria, TB burden is very huge. Um, annually, according to the um, WHO Global TB Report, we reported 410,000 cases, that is patients, of having TB in Nigeria. And out of this, there were 154,000 deaths. For of the 410,000 cases, we were expected as Nigerians to actually detect that is TB cases to be detected, we were only able to detect 300,000 cases. Why uh, is that so? Why? Because um, we believe that the low TB case finding is because a lot of Nigerians are not well uh, informed about the disease. And many of our people who have the disease do not go to the right places to seek help, where they can be um, investigators, tested, screened, and if they are found to be TB, they link to treatment. Many of them go to a patent medicine store, they go buy drugs, to a cough mixture over and over again, and they are missed out in proper treatment. And that is why also we are having increase in the, um, uh, the um, multi-drug resistant TB, because many people are not going to the right places, they're not getting the right treatment, and then the, a lot of the, the, the microbacterium is developing resistant to the regular simple antibiotics that actually uh, treat the disease and cure the disease in six months. Okay, TB is associated with coughing and all of that. Yes. How does one know he has TB? Yes, um, primarily because TB affects the lung primarily, and we, we call that pulmonary TB, it will also affect other organs in the body, such as the, um, the bones, the kidney, 
even the meninges, that is the, the, the covering of the brain, and with that it presents in, 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 in um, ways that actually depicts that is affecting those other organs. But primarily, because it affects the lungs, what we call pulmonary tuberculosis, people who have such disease will present with cough, majorly cough, cough of two weeks of more. They also have night sweats. They, become, they will be sweating when, when the environment does not warrant it. They also lose weight and I, I also get tired very easily. Mm. Those are the symptoms and signs of the disease. So when people see that they've been having cough and they've been going to um, uh, using medication and it's not going for two weeks or more, then they should suspect that it could be TB and they need to go and seek help. So how accessible is uh, treatment? I, I know of uh, the DOT strategy, that's the direct observation and treatment yeah, strategy. Yeah, yeah. How have we fed with our DOT strategy? Uh, drugs, like in Nigeria, we have 7,000 um, DOT centers. Okay. We have 2,650 microscopy centers. That is, those are the microscopy where you can use to investigate TB. But then there is a modern way of testing this disease, okay. which is faster. Not only that it's faster, it also helps to pick the resistance tree. That we call the gene expert test. The gene expert test site in Nigeria is 390. Even though the government, when the policy uh, came out in 2016 March, the government had wanted that um, we have these centers in every local government in Nigeria. That is to say, 774 sites in Nigeria. But unfortunately, we are just about maybe 40% of that they're about now. Which means we still have a long way to we, go. We still have, and that is why the government now is looking at universal health care coverage. Not the government is talking about universal health care coverage, in which TB is part. So the government, what government is doing, and with the, with the support of partners, is to scale up this gene expert sites. Not only scaling it, but to optimize the, the use of those sites. Because right now, even though those sites are there, People are not assessing the services. And there are some other um, confounding factors that are not helping us to optimize. And that's the effort that the present government is looking at critically to, be, to say that we want people who are sick of this disease, they should assess these services. Why? Because this service is even free. Okay. It's free. You go there, you get in there, you don't pay a dime. The TB affects not just the adults but also the, inf the children. And then the, the, the children, because, and one thing, because we're not even finding the adults, we're not also finding the children. L like in, in 2017, we're only able to find 7% of what we are supposed to, uh, what WHO depicted that we should find. And the reason is that investigating and uh, TB in children is difficult because many of them cannot produce sputum. But one thing that the government is also doing now is to um, scale up the chest history, support the chest history of children. We have our partners providing resources for us to support. What I mean by supporting is that when these children go to the chest, uh, chest x-ray site, they pay nothing. Their parents pay nothing. Mm. And all is, all is just to help to uptake the services, to let the parents to be, um, to encourage them to take their children, the children that are not thriving, uh, you see a child who's supposed to by now be walking, supposed to have gained weight, the child is not gaining weight, then it could be TB. Then they go to see the health worker who will now direct them to do the testing if that child cannot produce sputum. But if the child can produce sputum, then the sputum will be used to, um, the chest gene expert test will be used to diagnose the TB. So we, we can do that now. We can do that. And okay. one good thing now is, is that before now, the treatment, the drugs for the children, is bitter, is not child friendly, and there is a risk of having a resistance strain. But now, what the minister launched on, on the 23rd of this, well, at the commemoration of this, this, this year, World TB Day, is the, is the new fixed, dro fixed dose pediatric formulation, mm. which is sweetened and also flavored to make it attract for the child. And it's also dispersible. Just put it in the water, in a little quantity of water, it disperses and the child takes it. So it is child friendly, it is mother friendly. You don't need to struggle with the child for the child to take it. And with that, it makes um, treatment um, outcome. We okay. believe it makes treatment outcome better okay. because the children will take it 
We, we know TB is a disease that is uh, no, associated with poverty. What are some of those other you know, predisposing uh, factors for people to avoid? Overcrowding. Okay. We know people living in an overcrowding environment, not well ventilated environment, and then in, in uh, um, um, dirty environment, those are things that people should. But more importantly, we also want to emphasize that people who have HIV, if they cough of one day, you know I said TB is cough of two weeks or more. Mm -hmm. For an HIV patient, even cough of one day, they should come so that they can be investigated to make sure that we investigate them to see if they don't have TB. But for HIV patients who do not have TB, we also place them on what we call isoniazy preventive therapy to make sure that they don't come down with TB. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Lawanson, for you, coming on Health Options. Okay, thank you. I have been speaking with Dr. Adebola Lawanson, Proxy Control Program, Federal Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm.